Welcome back to another episode of Think Sit Bright. I'm Rick Pepito, and today I wanted to talk about vampires. They are what inspired my second book, Blood the Second Helping, and its spin-off, Legends of Vampire. So I wanted to get kind of into some of the myths and the origins of vampires, and even some real fun facts. Most people know Bram Stoker's Dracula as the definitive version of a vampire. When Bram Stoker was writing Dracula, he actually based it on a Romanian man named Vlad Tepes. He was also known as Vlad the Impaler. But even though Stoker portrayed him as the, te- the definitive vampire, in Romania, he's actually viewed as a hero who drove away the Ottoman Turks. He wasn't a blood-sucking sadist. But what is a vampire? A vampire, in common terms, is basically a revenant. It's a human corpse that comes back from the dead uh, to consume blood and survive. The myths date back centuries, and originally it wasn't even considered a corpse that came back. They were demonic entities that possessed a human. Matthew Beresford was the author of a book called From Demons to Dracula, The Creation of the Modern Vampire Myth. In it, he claims, based on fact, that it is impossible to determine when the first vampire myth arose. Some myths go back thousands of years to ancient Egypt and pinpoint it on sorcery. Ancient China had a creature called the Changxi, which was an evil spirit that attacked people and drained their life energy There are some things that are consistent and not consistent through different types of vampire lore. Some vampires are known to turn into different forms, mists, bats, wolves, but some don't have that. It's the same as holy water and a cross, or water and sunlight. Some are not afraid of fire, and some are. It all depends on who's telling the tale. There is one common universal thing, though. All these vampires all drink blood. Now, the classic way to become a vampire in most of these myths is to be bitten by one. And whether that means they fully drain you or they don't drain you and they leave you to slightly alive to slowly turn into a vampire, it again goes back to how the story is told. But a folklorist named Paul Barber said that centuries ago, it was believed that certain birth defects meant that you were going to become a vampire. Children that were born with teeth. And it was a rare thing, but people that had cleft lips and certain genetic abnormalities, certain abnormalities would actually allow, would actually help the person turn into a vampire as they got older. Others believed that certain forms of decay actually meant that someone was a vampire graves that were dug up and unearthed that happened to have various forms of decay or not decay. There were people that had died and been buried in a an airtight casket or grave and then put in a frozen or a cold ground to preserve them. Well, thousands of years ago, they didn't know the full details of decay. They just knew that when somebody died, they immediately began to decay. So months after digging these bodies up and in these preserved states, they were believing that these people would get up at night and come out of the grave as a vampire because their body wasn't decomposed to the rate that it should be. What they would do at this point was they would take pins and they would pin the body to the earth to keep them in place. And this is where the origin of the wooden stake through the heart comes from. But back then, they actually believed that iron rods would work better. Wood was just something that they might happen to have if they didn't have a rod. But it was the best place to pin one was through the chest. So the stake through the heart, that's where that originates from. Other traditional methods would be to decapitate a person and then stuff garlic or a stone in their mouth and set it upon a grave. And they've actually found evidence of this, of bodies who had their heads decapitated and had garlic or remnants of it or stone in their mouth. One rare thing that I had seen was 
Back in the old days, if you were being chased by a vampire, there was one fine way to get away. If you had a handful of salt and you threw it down on the ground, a vampire, for some reason, would be forced to stop and count each grain of salt. If you didn't have salt, sand would work, or grain, where a vampire would be forced to get down. And they found evidence of people who put trails of salt around the door to their homes to prevent any evil spirit from coming in at night. Or if they did, it would at least delay them until hopefully morning when the sun would rise and kill the vampire or chase them away. A lot of traditions also talk too that a vampire could not actually enter your house unless they were invited. And a lot of theory goes back to this being the origin of people telling their children about stranger danger and not allowing a stranger into your house. So this is what parents used to use as a myth to tell their kids, look, you can't just let somebody in the house, they might be a vampire. So basically they would scare their kids into believing this. The question is, are there really vampires? Well, in a sense, yes. There are creatures such as leeches, certain bats, vampire bats, lampreys, if I'm saying that right, Lots of parasites that actually latch on, ticks, and suck blood, mosquitoes. But there are people, too, who claim that they are a vampire of sorts. And this goes through satanic communities and often, often goth cultures, where people believe that by consuming blood, they are becoming a vampire slowly. The problem is that if a human is to drink too much blood, they could actually get sick from iron overdose. Not to mention all the other diseases out there but if it were pure blood, they could actually get sick just because of the iron amounts. But that's all kind of morbid. So I want to kind of get away from that and go back to when the first recorded vampire story was. And it dates back to in the Mediterranean. So there was this man named Ambrosio, according to legend. And he was an Italian adventurer. And he basically pissed off the Greek gods. The, the short story is that Apollo was the first god to get mad. So he cursed Ambrosio with, since Apollo was the sun god, he cursed the man with being sensitive to sunlight. So that if he ever stepped foot in sun again, his skin would literally burn. Following that, Ambrosio wanted to have some sort of rebound from this. So he made a deal and he sold his soul to Hades. So now you've got the sunlight myth and the lack of soul and the underworld coming into it. Apollo's sister also placed a curse on him, and she was the goddess of the hunt. And she made it so that his skin couldn't touch any silver, so that weapons made of silver could harm him. But Artemis wasn't all that cruel in her mind, so in order to make it so that Ambrosio wouldn't die, she granted him the gift of immortality. But of course that meant he would live forever in that current form, unable to ever go out in sunlight, unable to ever touch anything that was silver, and not having a soul. She also gave him the blessing of speed and strength of a hunter, which is where a lot of the super speed and strength of a vampire come from in, that, in those myths. So Ambrosio would go around at night and he would hunt swans. And I don't know why it's swans, but he would actually kill the swans and take their blood to write, use it as ink and to write letters to his love. In ancient Greece, that actually wasn't an uncommon thing. They would often use blood to write, the blood of animals that they would hunt and then eat, and then they would use their blood as ink. Once Ambrosio was able to adapt to all this, he moved back to Italy, now as a full-fledged vampire, and he built his first vampire clan, and they continued to build and build and build. Eventually, there was supposedly a civil war within the clan, and they all killed each other, except for Ambrosio, who still supposedly walks to this day. Somewhere in Florence, it's believed. Now, there is one real disease that does affect humans, and it's very, very rare, and I address this in my book as well, Porphyria. It's a type of hemophilia where the person cannot go into sunlight because their skin is hypersensitive to it. So it's kind of a combination of hemophilia and lupus. 
And if you don't know what hemophilia is, it's when a person gets cut and the platelets can't bond quick enough and coagulate so that blood, so that their wounds heal. So in Blood the Second Helping and its spin-off Legends of Vampire, it all focuses around Cain, and that is Cain from the Cain and Abel story. He's the first vampire in my story, and his first love is Lilith. And both, not Cain so much, but Lilith, the legend of her, is often associated with vampires or demons. I did an episode on King Arthur and the sword Excalibur. They come into play in the book. Also, the Holy Grail, and you actually find out what the Grail is. You find out the truth behind the sword in the stone. And then it goes to different eras where you f there's the riddle of the Sphinx. Sobek was an ancient Egyptian crocodile god who is also inclu included in the story. I did address Vlad Tepes as the hero against a vampire lord named Alucard, which is Dracula backwards. That's also a name that's been used in a lot of vampire stories, specifically the Castlevania series of video games. But I wanted Vlad to get the hero treatment since he's always seen as this monster and the Romanians actually believe he was a hero. I address how wine is good for the blood. And one thing I've never really seen in any kind of vampire fiction was there's all of these STDs and diseases of the blood that go around, but you never actually see that addressed in when a vampire is drinking blood. So I decided to have a situation where one of the vampires contracts the HIV virus and you see what happens to it, what, what it does to the vampire. Historical figures such as Samson and Delilah and Elizabeth Bathory get the treatment. Stonehenge has a presence, and the Russo-Japanese War actually shows up in a short story, too. Where I came up with the title for Blood the Second Helping was I knew it was going to be my second book back when I was writing my first book, and I wanted it to be the second helping because, yes, it's a sequel, but Blood was, was the main dish, so it made sense to put it that way. Each chapter in the book is called a legend. I don't actually call my chapters in the books by chapter or number, I have legend, and each legend had a different thing. So the spinoff was called Legends of Vampire, and it's just a short story. I figured this would be a good episode just in time for Halloween. I'm wondering what your favorite vampire movies are. I'm actually drinking a vampire wine right now, and there are a lot of really cool movies and books out there and games. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are. You can hashtag script Halloween. Make sure to hashtag, hashtag think sip right. Tag me. I'll retweet or whatever your social media platform is. And if you do it before October 31st, you're actually put in the running for a free copy of one of my books. So like, share, have a good sip. Cheers.